Belva and the choir, you know that song will be going through my head for the next 24 hours. Welcome to Lakeside Presbyterian Church. I know that it's the first time for several of you, and I think, wherever it is, there it is, I think you received a welcome bag. If not, be sure to pick one up on your way out. This tells about our church, our ministry, how you can get involved in the Lakeside Presbyterian family. Also in there is a cookie, which I found out from some folks that uh, came last week. Husband and wife shared the cookie. That's why it's a big cookie, so enough to share for everyone. The announcements are on the back of your bulletin. One that is not on there, which is very, very important, is that this coming Saturday, the 4th of March, is the bazaar. The bazaar will be held here at the church beginning at 9.30, and this is to raise money for our outreach feeding program. So if you want to come and avail yourself of someone else's treasures, please, 9.30 till 1 o'clock, I believe. Hopefully they'll sell out before then, but uh, that's very important. We have a lot of things going on at Lakeside Presbyterian. Last week, uh, Tuesday was another very successful women's luncheon. Uh, they actually are getting at least half as many people at the women's luncheon trying to count men and women. They had, they had over 20 people, so that's a very successful time there. The white rose this morning on the altar is in memory of Dr. Bob Plenty. Bob and Becky came down from Cincinnati where he was a trauma room surgeon a number of years ago and they founded La Ola Girls Orphanage. Uh, through the years, and they're building a new property, through the years they've educated, uh, loved, and uh, cared for and renewed over a hundred girls uh, in these past several years. It's even built to the point now that I understand from a Facebook posting this morning, they're housing and training a hundred girls right now. They've been very successful putting wonderful Christian young ladies out on the street. The celebration of Bob's life will be Saturday, March the 14th. I believe it said March 18th, I'm sorry, and details will follow as to the time and exactly the location. On the table out front, we have the daily breads for March in the regular print and also in the large print. So avail yourself of those uh, daily breads if you like the hard copies. Also out there, I only see one left, is the current email telephone list for attendees of our church here at Lakeside Presbyterian. So if you want one of those, pick it up. Uh, if they're all gone, uh, Francisco will print some more and they'll be out there next week. Uh, what else? Oh, mail. Anyone going to the United States this week? Oh, lots of folks. Okay, we'll get it, uh, get it to, the, to the Vogels and we decide whether we want to send it from, uh, what, Washington, Oregon, or from Illinois. So we'll decide a bit later on. I think that pretty well covers the announcements. So now let's prepare to worship our main purpose here today. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray for your blessing on the church in this place. Here may the faithful find salvation and the careless be awakened. Here may the doubting find faith and the anxious be encouraged. Here may the tempted find help and the sorrowful find comfort. Here may the weary find rest and the strong be renewed. Here may the aged find consolation and the young be inspired. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 91. They who dwell in the shelter of the Most High 
will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. So now please stand and join in our first song at number 366 and remain standing for the responsive reading. Our responsive reading this morning is from Psalm 32. Please join me in the bold face type. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely 
You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. You may be seated. Our first reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, and Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work in and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This is the word of the Lord. You may remain seated for our next song. Our second reading is from Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 19. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death came to all people because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, Death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. 
For if, by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of the righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Please for the reading of the gospel. This is from Matthew chapter 4. And Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. But Jesus answered him, It is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and its splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angel came and attended him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Now is the time of our pastoral prayer. Our gracious God, what a privilege and joy it is to come before you, to enter your throne of grace, knowing that you love us and that you hear us and that you respond to our prayers. Father, you are the almighty, holy, loving God. And we come together today that we might acknowledge you and praise you and thank you for all that you've been doing. Lord, we pray today for our sister churches that are in this area. Be with each one and help all of us to remember that we truly have one Lord, one church, one baptism, and we are all part of the same family. Father, we pray for Christians around the world that are worshiping you, and we lift up our hearts and our minds together to rejoice and worship you. And now, Lord, we pray for the members of our church, and we have many needs. There are those that have health problems, those that have emotional difficulties, those that have financial problems, and we pray for each one that you might meet and supply our needs. Lord, we do pray for Bob's family as they go through the grieving process. Stand beside them, watch over them, Lord, and guide them. Father, we thank you that Gary has been doing much better. His color has improved, and he goes in this next week now for surgery. And we ask that you'll be with the doctors and nurses that are ministering to him. We pray that you'll keep him from great pain and return him safely to us again. We pray for Catherine Gonzalez and ask that you would just remember her during this very difficult time in her life. Be with John as well. Father, forgive us today for all of our sins. Let us this next week walk with Jesus and let us become more like him. And now we pray together the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand and join in our next song, number 72, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Please remain standing and join me in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and our preparation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and ascended at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism with forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. It seems that people want nothing more than they want their own freedom. They want to make their own decisions. They want to depend on no one else, and they want to stay in control. Wars are fought over freedom. The idea of freedom is what birthed the United States and Mexico. Now, Canada seems to be okay with that constitutional monarchy, so maybe they're the exception that proves the rule. But the only thing that people want more than freedom, I think, is rules. <laughs> they want freedom for me and rules for other people. I exaggerate, but only a little. <laughs> so in Paul's letter to the Galatians, the Apostle Paul, like Jesus, says we have things just kind of backwards. Paul tells us that Christ has set us free, free to become the people that God created us and redeemed us to be. For some people, this freedom is a little too wild, a little too unpredictable, and maybe even too available. But it's a wild, unpredictable, unpredictable and very loving God whom we worship. So, uh-oh, I have to turn it on. I always forget that part. Our key word for the book of Galatians is faith. And our key verse is Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This book was written probably around A.D. 48, which makes it quite early um, in terms of Paul's letters. The Galatians, who he wrote to, were being deceived by false teachers. They were known as Judaizers. These people were teaching a gospel that really was no gospel at all, according to Paul. It was not good news, it was bad news. They said that in order to be a real Christian, you had to become Jewish first, or later, whenever. You had to become Jewish. Paul wrote to the confused believers in Galatia to help them see that what they were being taught was a false gospel that depended on human effort to make a person acceptable to God, which was completely contrary to the true gospel of salvation by grace through the power of the Holy Spirit. Very few people are telling Christians nowadays that they need to become Jewish, but have you ever heard anyone say, I don't want to become a Christian because I'd have to give up too much? Yeah, we Christians are known for having a ton of rules. When I was a kid, it was don't smoke, don't drink, don't go to movies, don't dance, um, don't play cards. Sounds really fun, huh? <laughs> and yet, none of these rules are in the Old or New Testament. 
Jesus said that he came that we might have a full life, an abundant life, not a life of restriction and slavery, except for slavery to Christ himself. And that's one of the Apostle Paul's main themes, particularly in Galatians. When we limit Christianity to certain cultures like Judaism in Paul's time, or subcultures like strict fundamentalism in our time, or even people who insist that if you really are a Christian, you have to vote a certain way, we minimize the power of the gospel. When we require people to adopt our specific practices in addition to faith in order to be considered Christian, we undercut the whole message of Jesus Christ. Paul and the leaders of the church in Jerusalem had already agreed that Gentile Christians did not need to be circumcised. But then, oddly, Peter came to Antioch, and everything got put to the test, and Paul talks about that in the book of Galatians. So he tells the story. When Cephas, and that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Paul had already been breaking the Jewish food laws by eating with Gentile believers. He had learned about his freedom as a Christian when he was still with Jesus. In Matthew, Mark 7, 18 and 19, Jesus says, Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. And then this happened before Peter had his vision described in Acts. Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a vo voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back into heaven. So Peter was there when Jesus declared all foods clean, and then after Jesus' death and resurrection, Peter received his own personal vision about this. But, and Paul argued that by not living in freedom, Peter would force the Gentiles to follow Jewish customs, and that would cause all kinds of damage. When Peter ate with them, he communicated that they were accepted, that they were in fellowship. And when he backed away by not being in fellowship with the Gentile believers in order to maintain Jewish practices, he was saying, in effect, that Jewish practices were still important, maybe even crucial for Christian believers. And that's why Paul called Peter out for acting one way around Gentiles in another way around those who still practice the Jewish law. Paul was concerned that Peter's behavior could be interpreted that there might be something more believers had to do to continue in God's grace after salvation. Do we do this? Do we put roadblocks in front of others that prevent them from coming to Christ? Do we fail to even associate with some people based, whose sensibilities offend us? How are they to learn about Jesus if we avoid them? I actually had something like this happen here in Ahihik. Non-believing friends were visiting me from Seattle, and I invited some people from the church to dinner to meet them. This couple had been praying for my friend's salvation, but they hadn't met them, and so I thought that would be good. My Seattle friends that evening used some vulgar language during the meal. And while never confronting my friends, I'm 
happy to say. The husband of this couple came to me the next Sunday and shook his finger in my face and said, don't invite us to meet those people again. No one ever talks like that in front of my wife. Now, I understand. I have no problem letting my friends know that I really don't want to hear Jesus' name being used as a swear word, for example. It bothers me. But I don't clobber new acquaintances with my issue, and everyone I've said this to has understood and been sensitive because we're friends, but that wasn't what had happened. This gentleman and his wife withdrew from any relationship with anyone who used four-letter words that have nothing to do with taking God's name in vain. If my friends ever had learned of this, I'm afraid that they'd think that this was part of what it means to be a Christian. It made me sad that my church-going friends were limiting God's grace in this way. So if we want to have a right relationship with God, what is the answer? if it's not all these rules. Well, it's faith. First of all, we are justified by faith, and we heard the word justification in our um, second reading this morning from Romans. It's one of Paul's favorite words. He says, We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Galatians 2, 15 and 16. In our modern English, the word justified means something different from what Paul says. We may say something like, it seems like Lisa was overreacting, but it turns out she was justified, meaning she was right all along. For Paul, justification, ju being justified, means being declared not made right or righteous, acquitted, even though you're guilty. Those whom God declares righteous in these verses are not righteous. They are sinners. It's only because we put our faith in Jesus that God can remain righteous himself while declaring unrighteous people like us to be righteous. Three times Paul says in this ver these verses that he says that no one is justified by observing the law. Three times he says we are justified by faith in Christ. This is the central point of the gospel message. This is the good news. More than this, faith is how justification is received, not why we deserve it. You have faith because of God's grace. Faith is God's gift to you. In Ephesians, we, um, Paul says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Faith is a gift. And even though everyone knows right from wrong, we can't do it. Jews know the requirement demanded in the written law, and Gentiles have the law written on their hearts. That's in Romans. Paul says, indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. So these Judaizers who were misleading the Galatians, they could argue that eliminating the law would encourage godless people living. The thinking is that by eliminating the law, you eliminate a person's sense of moral responsibility. If people can be accounted righteous simply by believing that Christ died for them, there's no need to be good. The result of your doctrine is that people will believe in Christ, but after that, do whatever they want, and that was scary for them. Paul's answer is absolutely not. Of course, we Christians do sin, but this isn't because we're justified by faith. Christ isn't responsible for it. If we sin, we are responsible. Yes, people are accepted by God as righteous, even though they're not, but this takes place only because God has justified them through Christ's death, death and resurrection. And this should mean real transformation. We are in Christ, Paul says, and we are a new creation. But there's more. This faith is not just a one-time thing that happened in the past when you got saved so that you would make sure that you would and go to heaven when you die. Faith is just as important in our everyday life. We're not just justified by faith. 
We live by faith. Paul says in Galatians, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So through faith in Christ, a person is freed to have a true relationship with God. What amazing, incredibly good news. Through the law, through the law, meaning Christ's death, I died to the law so that I might live for God. Yes, freedom is found in relationship with God. Those Judaizers in Paul's time and the rule makers in our own time think that we need to follow a formula, that we need to keep some rules and follow a certain number of steps just to be sure we're really Christians. But this is exactly the problem we had before we had faith in Jesus. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That's dramatic. I've been crucified with Christ. Paul's old life of self-effort has been condemned and put on the cross. Paul has committed himself in no uncertain terms to his new relationship with Jesus and his new purpose in living. By faith, he lives in union with Jesus. Christ lives in me. For the believer, then, works aren't a prerequisite for salvation. Rather, they're a response. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Does that touch you like it touches me? I read a lot of emotional meaning into that sentence. Paul says, Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. Paul didn't know Jesus when Jesus was walking on earth before the resurrection, but Jesus knew him, and this is true of us, too. We're not Peter, who walked with Jesus, yet we can say, he loved me and gave himself for me. Paul knows who owns his life right now. How about us? Have we opened ourselves to really following Jesus? who pours his love and grace into our lives. So, faith is what justifies us in the past, and faith in God is how we live in the present. Faith also gives us hope for the future. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await, by faith, the righteousness for which we hope. We will continue to become more and more like Christ as we live in faith not by the works of the law, but by the Spirit's movement in our lives. Our hope is, not, is that the moment we wait for, when we stand in God's presence and are found not guilty, we are made righteous solely because of God's grace and our faith. One of my very favorite verses from Galatians is Galatians 5.1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm there, then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. I think that's glorious. We don't have to choose between living a shallow, sad life absent from God or a cookie-cutter life bound by rigid rules. We are made free in Christ to live in relationship with him and do what God created us to do. Jesus set us free. He bought our freedom with his own life. And if you go back to slavery, you're rejecting an infinitely valuable gift. And Paul goes on to say, here's just a bit about what that freedom might look like. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. There's nothing there that says you must do this or you can't do that. What you are given to do, do it in step with the Spirit. Do it in the power of the Spirit. And don't judge either yourself or others. Rather, Paul says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ 
Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Are we people of faith? If we are, we've been justified by faith. We will live by that faith. We will have hope for the future through faith. Most of all, we will be transformed by that faith. Christ will live in us. We will follow his spirit. We will carry each other's burdens. We will be not become weary in doing good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. It delights me that I do see this kind of faith in our family here at Lakeside Presbyterian. Let's continue to grow in that faith so that it's clear that we no longer live, but Christ lives in us. Amen. As we now come to present our tithes and offerings, this from Matthew 6. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. stand and join in the doxology. now come to our time of communion when we share together in the body and blood of Jesus in recognition of his great sacrifice for us. Here at Lakeside Presbyterian, we practice open communion. That means all baptized believers in Jesus Christ may share at this table. This is not to be taken lightly, as the Apostle Paul wrote, 
to the church in Corinth about partaking in this communion. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. And so now as we prepare to come to the table, let us confess our sins against God and men. Holy and merciful God, we acknowledge and confess before you our sinful nature, prone to evil and slow to do good, and all of our shortcomings and offenses. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways and wasting your gifts and forgetting your love. We confess our sins against our brothers and sisters, the hardness of our hearts toward those in suffering and need, our indifference toward justice and mercy, our arrogance and all the evil ways of our selfishness and pride. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your tender mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Do not cast us away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and uphold us with your spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. As each of us now in silence confess our personal sins to you. Amen. If you have truly repented, our almighty God has forgiven your sins and granted you full assurance of pardon strengthened and confirmed you in all good works and brought you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now some instructions. After the words of institution, the ushers will release the rows one at a time starting at the back to come down the center aisle. Once you have received the elements, go back down the side aisles to return to your seats. You'll note that today there are two stations offering, so go to the station on your side of the aisle. If you're unable to come forward, we'll bring the elements to you immediately after others have been served. And as a sign, we take this communion as a celebration of our personal relationship with Jesus. Please eat the bread immediately as you receive it. And as a sign that we also share this communion as the community that is the body of Christ, please take the cup back to your seat with you, and we will all drink together after everyone has been served. Let's come before the Lord today and hand over our cares and our troubles. Let's ask his forgiveness and receive the bread and the wine together as one family, one body. In the beginning, God created us for himself, but even though we have fallen through our disobedience to sin and to death, God in his infinite mercy and grace and love sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to live among us. He suffered every hardship and adversity, every trial, trouble, and temptation that we face, except without sin. And finally, he stretched out his arms upon the cross in perfect obedience to the will of the Father and offered himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and after he had blessed it, he said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, 
which is poured out for you and for many for the remission of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in, we, in me will never be thirsty. Therefore, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup in faith, we do so in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ, proclaiming his death until he comes again. He is coming again. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you unto eternal life. Will the communion service kindly come forward? Thank you.
gifts of God for the people of God. Take and feed on them in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Let's partake of the cup together. Let's pray. Father, you created us to worship you and freely enjoy your presence. We thank you that you have met us in your Son and brought us home, that we can experience the true peace of your presence. Amen. After the service, please join us in the narthex for cookies and coffee. If you'd like a tour of the building, we're more than just this big room. Talk to one of the pastors as you leave, and they'll arrange for a, for a tour. So please now stand and sing our final song, number 530, Faith of the Fathers, of our fathers. Moses came down from the mountain after his contact with God. His face was glowing so much that he had to cover it with a veil to keep people from being afraid. May the glory of the Lord show on your face throughout this week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he turn his face to you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.